taking place in Germany. The ship is the QE2. It's an £80 million contract, and although British GEC is supplying the ship's electric motors, no British shipyard is involved. Charles Wheeler's been finding out why. The regimental band of the 15th, 19th King's Royal Hussars playing to the QE2 as she prepares to cast off from Southampton en route for New York at 7 o'clock last Sunday evening. She's due in New York at 8 o'clock on Friday morning, and her captain and chief engineer will be sailing with their fingers crossed. For since the spring, the QE2 has occasionally been plagued by boiler trouble. The fact is that this handsome but aging vessel is being worked at the limit of her strength. She spends no fewer than 240 days at sea, cruising throughout the winter and shuttling back and forth across the Atlantic in summer with less than a day between voyages in port. She's getting too old to stand the pace. Her troubles aren't exactly terminal, merely the equivalent of hardening arteries and stiffness in the joints, but to prolong her life by another 20 years, her owners are giving the queen a transplant, taking her out of commission for six winter months while she's given new engines. The QE2 was launched in the John Brown shipyard on the River Clyde in 1967. Those were the days of the slogan, Britain can make it. Completing her took another 19 months. She was to have had four boilers. To save money, Cunard settled for three, a decision the owners must now regret. For 17 years, she's been the most glamorous ship in the world and has earned her owners hundreds of millions of dollars. Most of her passengers are American tourists, even this week. To replace her now would cost Cunard anything from 200 to 400 million pounds. Not that any British shipyard could build a passenger liner today. As for the rejuvenation she is to undergo this winter, the work will be done in West Germany, since Britain cannot make it any longer. By any standard, re-engineering a ship like the QE2 is a daunting project, but it's a valuable order and a prestigious one too. When Cunard invited tenders, they came in from France and Scandinavia, from Japan, from Korea, and from three West German yards. Not one British yard put in a bid. But can we really afford to lose an order like that, let it go abroad? Could the government perhaps have done something? We asked the Department of Trade and Industry. Good heavens, no, they said. It's nothing to do with us. This is a purely commercial order. The decision to bid or not to bid was not made here, but in Newcastle at the headquarters of British shipbuilders. As for the workforce, its leaders were not consulted. We are standing right on the, in the area that has outfitted and carried out all sorts of major work on the largest liners that the world has ever seen. And there is no doubt in my mind that given the motivation and given the support that that job could have been done in the United Kingdom. Do you think it's a major fit-up to a West German company to got this major contract now? Of course it does. For any other European country other than Great Britain to secure a major refurbishing contract for Cunard is a national disgrace. Well put quite simply um, it went to uh, a German yard because the British yards didn't want to tender for it. Uh, we invited tenders from various uh, people and for various reasons which are obviously uh, their concern they elected uh, not to enter into further detailed discussions with us. It was sad for us that no British yard felt able to even offer um, uh, to come and talk to us about it. Didn't they talk to you about the talk? Not uh, in any detail, no. We couldn't, in our view, achieve the time scale. It's seven months, it was a very tight time scale, and if you don't have the facilities for doing the job, then you can't really bid for it. This well, is the as simple as Southampton, that. which fits the ship, with quite a lot of measurement to spare at either end. Yes, but it doesn't have the craneage because there, there are eight new engines to go into the ship. And in fact, you, there, there are many hundreds of tons. You have to lift them in as one unit. You can't strip them down if you're going to meet the time limit. And therefore, you've got to have good craneage. And that dock doesn't happen to have the kind of craneage that's needed. I can assure you, we looked at every possible way of doing it. And that was at the time, of course, that we did have the ship repair facility in use at Southampton. So we, we did have that facility, that backup, people who could look at it properly for us. 
We've been down to Southampton, we've looked at the dock, we've yes. looked at the cranage, and we have been told by people that it would be possible to provide the cranage there, either by hiring or bringing in a floating crane. There is one, in fact, at this moment, a 200-ton floating tra crane just down the quayside. Yes, well, you well who are we to argue with an expert? But surely there is more than one way to refit a ship. What seems to have deterred potential British builders for the contract is the prospect of having to cut an enormous hole in the side of the QE2. While she's in a dry dock that might well be long enough to take the ship with ease, but could be uncomfortably narrow given the size of the boilers that have to come out and the generators and the engines that have to go in through the same hole. But as we shall show, there is another method. British shipbuilders apparently didn't think of it. And neither did Cunard until the German ship repairer who got the contract signed it and then told the owners how he was going to do the job. The ship is coming in. She goes into that dock. We will pump, dry, pump the dock dry. And then we are taking away the funnel. Then we're removing all the exhaust from the main boilers, air trunking from the main, in order to have a clearly space where we can take out the old equipment like the main, the main turbines, auxiliary turbine, and the main boiler. Everything goes out. And we are not going from the side, but we are going from the removed funnel with a floating crane, which will be positioned over there behind the shed. We have found a big crane, and the crane is now working in the North Sea, and he has it reached so that we can take out uh, pieces up to a weight of 80, 90 tons each. And then what happens? Then we take the ship flo uh, flo uh, flooded up again, and then we take the ship over to the pier in a floating uh, uh, condition. But over here? Yeah, over there, here. The hardest work will now be done with the QE2 tied up along the quayside. A German diesel engines and British driving motors made by GEC and weighing 450 tons apiece will be lifted from pontoons and lowered through the top of the ship by the floating crane now alongside the liner. Herr Knurth's dry dock is smaller than several in Britain, including the one in Southampton, and he's hiring the heavy crane, as British shipbuilders might have done. But will he be able to keep his promise to finish the job in 179 days? British shipbuilders shied away from the risk. For when the work is done, the QE2 is going cruising without a single day's delay. If she's held up, the shipyard will have to pay. Now, you're going to do this in 179 days? Exactly, yes. Are you sure? Yes, if, if I would not be sure, I would not have signed the contract. So, for Lloyd Veft, the QE2 re-engineering contract is a boom. It will occupy 800 men for half a year, and it will attract attention of owners of passenger ships all across the world, for there is still a market for major ship repairing and conversion.